<laughs> One thing I like that you did in your book is you told your audience where you were coming from. And that's something we haven't really gotten into yet, but I think that influences us. I am a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. I come from a more conservative faith tradition. And I will admit right up front, I think that's a better thing to do than to hide it. That probably influences my decisions or conclusions a little bit, particularly when the data are as ambi ambiguous as they are currently. Well, that's exactly what I was going to ask you about. And, you know, when Eric was on uh, sort of doing a media uh, tour and a book tour, he sent me an audio clip of an uh, appearance he made on a uh, talk show in Colorado, and it was a Christian talk show. I think he may have alluded to it in his, in his presentation. And right up front, the, the host of the show wanted to know what Eric's story was. Was he a believer, wasn't he? And what I wanted to do was, for you folks t tonight, when each of these speakers got up and began to talk, all I want to know is, with a show of hand, does it matter to you one way or the other whether or not the people that are presenting this evidence and analyzing are Christian, Jewish, Scientologist, humanist, if you just show a hands, if, you, if it matters to you, if, you, if you're thinking about it as this evidence is presented. Interesting. Well, you know, and I, I think, that's, he I think yeah. that's healthy. And that's one place where I might comment on the Andrews way. It kind of says, you know, treat the evidence, you know, honestly, as if the evidence is some kind of brute fact out there that you don't have to interpret. And one of the reasons why it's good that we let each other as scholars know where we're coming from is because our presuppositions will often influence how we interpret the text. And it's not just people of faith presuppositions, it's also people who don't share that faith. Everybody has faith presuppositions, even if they're not religious. Give me an example. What would be an example of, I put some evidence in front of you and you're seeing different things because of that? Well, you know, one thing is dealing with the ambiguity of the evidence, say. Um, um, Eric pointed out that according to traditional interpretation of archaeological evidence, Jericho wasn't inhabited during the period of time, whether you're talking about an early exodus or a late exodus. That's not apparently, I'm not an archaeologist, but I studied archaeological method, and I've read different interpreters on this subject. That's not the only way to interpret that evidence. There's ambiguity in the archaeological evidence. There's also ambiguity in the biblical text, precisely what it is claiming and stating. I think you guys are exactly right that uh, I don't think we need to picture two million people marching up through the wilderness, that there may have, there probably was a much smaller group. There's a lot of question about the numbers themselves that need to be interpreted, and I think you're exactly right too, that people joined from Canaanite, uh, you know, who were Canaanites and came over to the Israelite side, et cetera, it's a mixed multitude. We could talk about these things again, and I think that's important to keep in mind as well. 